NTR. September vorig jaar, ruim 20 jaar na de afschaffing van de apartheid in Zuid-Afrika, protesten van een nieuwe generatie. Het witte regime heeft plaatsgemaakt voor een zwarte regering, maar opnieuw gaan jongeren de straat op. Voor wat? De strijd tegen de apartheid. Toen en eigenlijk nog steeds. actually done the homework and be honest because honesty goes the, a long way okay listen up is there a difference between the VOC and the Dutch East India Company no. do you remember when I was telling you that yes. that the Dutch were actually ruling at the Cape in one point dang it yes. and we remember that Britain took over the Cape from the Dutch yes my man uh, why, like in South Africa, mostly we learn a uh, European history than African history? Apartheid times, history. All you learned about was actually the white and um, the, the, the poor history. So we learn about Jan van Riebeck and all of those things. But they didn't check on Shara and all of those other African leaders, okay? As you know that 1994, this is when we got our freedom. And when you got our freedom, this is the time when the government actually had power to actually change curriculum. And this is why even in universities today, have you heard the term decolonized education? <laughs> decolonized education, it means that we need to put in African history also in the textbooks. So this is the fight that is actually happening now. I hope you are satisfied with the way I answered you there. Kinda. Yes. Kinda. <laughs> <laughs> My name, Nkolulego, it means freedom, because I was born in 1994. The year democracy yeah. started, Mandela came to came power. To That's to your power. year of yes, birth. That's my year of birth. So in the year of decolonization, you were born and you got this mission to work on decolonization of history. Yeah, yeah. The fight is not only the fight of these textbooks. It's a fight of also uh, uh, a university um, 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 discourses. They're also fighting in that sense that they want university discourses to be decolonized, some of them. So the fight is going on in every aspect of South Africa, not just in the school context, but in every aspect of South Africa. Hello. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hello, Hans. Hi. 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 Hello. Hi. Hans. Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that yeah. Oh, that's for me. How yeah. we're going to tackle this language-wise? Yeah. Yeah. No, I can speak Nederlands, but it doesn't make me out. Wilma and Patrick. Zij Nederlands, hij Zuid-Afrikaans. Ze leerden elkaar kennen toen Wilma begin jaren tachtig betrokken raakte bij de strijd tegen apartheid. Ik studeerde wiskunde, maar ik vond ook politiek heel erg leuk. En ik vond het heel moeilijk om dat met elkaar te combineren. Dus toen ik op een gegeven moment zag dat er een advertentie was voor leraren op de ANC-school... Ik dacht, dat is precies hetgene wat ik wil. De ANC-school was natuurlijk lesgeven voor een bevrijdingsbeweging. Het was een beweging die bezig was met voorbereidingen naar, uh, voor een nieuw Zuid-Afrika. En om daar nou bij betrokken te zijn als wiskundedocenten. 
Dat was op dat moment gewoon een, een ideale combinatie. En zo belandt een 20-jarige boerendochter uit Zaandam op een ANC-school in Tanzania. In een kamp waar het verboden ANC ballingen en vluchtelingen uit Zuid-Afrika opvangt. Een van die ballingen is de ANC-strijder Patrick, sindsdien haar man. We zijn op weg naar het ouderlijk huis van Patrick, in Transkei, het voormalige thuisland dat onder de apartheid was toegewezen aan de Kossa. Een door droogte en erosie geteisterd gebied waar de vrouwen het hoofd boven water proberen te houden, terwijl de mannen ver weg in de stad aan het werk zijn. This is uh, where I was born. I lived most of my life with my mother here. This piece of land that you see here was a piece of land that belonged to my father and my mother. It's a big garden. We had lots of fruit trees. And though we were poor, we were able to live from the maize we planted here, the fruit and the vegetables that we planted. But when the system of apartheid came, and because they had put us in these small pieces of land, the Transkei became too overcrowded. So what they did was to cut the gardens. That would mean that you lose your vegetable garden, you lose your garden where the maize was being uh, cultivated. The door is open. The door is open. Um, and your brother is living here now? Yes. You see, if you come in here, you can see that this is my home. That's your real life. And your firstborn? Yes. Which year was this? This is, uh, this is 1985. So what did you notice of apartheid? in a community of only black people? Well, I say that um, in terms of racial divisions and racial relations, we didn't notice much. But after some time, you realize that train drivers are all white. And on the other hand, you're told that black people cannot drive a train. After some time, you also begin to believe it. You don't put a line that the reason why we don't, have to, we don't have black train drivers is not because they cannot, but because they are deprived of the opportunities. My mother, I think, uh, wanted all of us to be educated. Uh, she hoped that if we got education, that we would have a better life than she had gone through. When we were supposed to go to secondary school, I was busy preparing myself, uh, washing myself to go to town, thinking that I was going to work in the mines because I did not foresee that it would be possible for me to go to secondary school. And just as I was busy washing, she came from a neighbor's running and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm washing. What are you going to do? I said, I'm going to town. I want to go to the mines. She said, no, 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 no. It's not going to happen. Sit down. She says, I want you to go and study something where you'll put on a tie. In my first year at university in 1973, I got involved in a strike. We had meetings as university students, people talking we should not accept and do education. From that moment on, I began to inquire about the history of the struggle. I got to know about the ANC. I got to listen to Radio Freedom, which was being uh, broadcast from Lusaka. And that's how I became politically active. Ook elders in het land staat de nieuwe generatie op tegen apartheid. Nieuwe wetgeving die onderwijs verplicht stelt in de taal van de apartheid, het Afrikaans, vormt de spreekwoordelijke druppel. 16 juni 1976. In Soweto, een township onder de rook van Johannesburg, gaan scholieren de straat op tegen het zogeheten Bantu-onderwijs. Ze willen onderwijs in eigen taal. De politie grijpt genadeloos in. Duizenden scholieren raken gewond 
of worden gearresteerd. Honderden vinden de dood. After Soweto, after the outbreak of the Soweto uprisings, I realized I couldn't hold myself anymore. I couldn't accept the killing of the children in Soweto. And I knew that if I stayed, I would be arrested and I'll end up in prison. And I decided to join the ANC. Patrick belandt in een geheim militair kamp buiten de landsgrenzen, waar ook veel van de gevluchte scholieren uit Soweto terechtkomen. Om van daaruit acties te ondernemen tegen het apartheidsregime. Are you prepared to fight? I'm very much prepared to fight. The only solution for us in South Africa is nothing else but to take up arms and face the enemy and fight the enemy for the sake of conquering and getting our soil back. Zo begint een fase van steeds heviger geweld in de strijd tegen de apartheid. Maar tegelijkertijd ontstaat er in het diepste geheim een initiatief om de strijdende partijen bij elkaar te brengen. Na de Soweto-opstand laat het apartheidsregime geen enkele ruimte voor oppositie. Alleen binnen de muren van de Zwarte Kerk lijkt het nog mogelijk om in het openbaar kritiek te uiten op het regime. Ik wil graag welkom speciaal bij deze sessie. Professor Hooswart. Hij komt uit Holland, de Nederlands. Professor Hooswart. It gives me so much joy to be here in the church, which also honors the name of Dr. Elia Thema, who was a very good friend of me. I was here about 40 years ago in the midst of the struggle against apartheid. And we met the first time. Dominee Elia Thema. Voormalig Tweede Kamerlid Bob Goudswaard leert hem eind jaren 70 kennen als een van de sleutelfiguren in Soweto. In Thema's kerk vinden scholieren tijdens de rellen een schuilplaats voor de politie. Thema heeft nauwe banden met het ANC, maar ook met generaal Van den Berg, vertrouweling van het Zuid-Afrikaanse regime. Dat brengt hem op een idee. Elia Thema kwam met een heel gedurfd plan. En dat plan was gericht op het mogelijk maken van het eerste contact tussen zwarte en blanke leiders in Zuid-Afrika omdat ook die predikanten vonden dat de situatie na Soweto in 1976 onhoudbaar was geworden. Thema vraagt Goudswaard om contact te leggen met de Nederlandse minister van Buitenlandse Zaken, Van der Klauw. Ze reizen samen af naar Den Haag. Dus op een avond reden we in mijn autootje naar zijn huis toe en werden we ontvangen. En toen zei Elia Thema, hij had wel een uur nodig om het te vertellen. Het, het is onmogelijk om zwarte en blanke leiders in Zuid-Afrika met elkaar te laten spreken. Dus dat moet op een bepaalde manier op internationale grond gebeuren. Maar nu is er de mogelijkheid, als u daaraan zou willen meewerken... om aan de Nederlandse regering, dat ze de zwarte leiders dan doen... een, een vergatschip te vragen of een ander schip... wat in staat is naar Zuid-Afrika te koersen en daar... Nelson Mandela voor twee of drie dagen op te pikken uit naar Robben Island. Die zou dan daar aan boord stappen. En dan dus een gesprek van twee, drie dagen over de toekomst van Zuid-Afrika. Toen tot mijn verrassing, dat was omstreeks half tien, zei de minister van de Klauw, you have your ship. To be frank, I, I want to be serious. But it's possible for them to think about a possibility of a ship. Dat de ANC en de Salvation Government kunnen met elkaar en discussen. Serieus, ik dacht dat het een joke was. Listen, the initiative did not succeed. Why not? The black leadership has, even at that time, been open to a possibility of negotiations. I think so. It has been, so. it has been one of the forefront approach. I see. But the harder the repression. Yes. Yeah. En de harder de militarisatie van onze samenleving, de meer het minimaliseert de gevoel en de conviction dat een negotiatie was mogelijk. 
het was wel met, met verdriet dat we dat allebei constateerden. Want de situatie in Zuid-Afrika werd zo, zo benauwend slecht. Het is vol verdrukking. Dus het was uitermate urgent dat er een vredesinitiatief kwam. Dat initiatief zou nog jaren op zich laten wachten. Waar zijn we dan? Dit is ja. jullie nieuwe huis. Dit is ons nieuwe huis. Onze trots. Ja. Midden in Transkei, vlakbij zijn ouderlijk huis, bouwen Patrick en Wilma een huis voor later. Patricks boekencollectie is al overgebracht. Juridische literatuur, jeugd- en schoolboeken, een fotoalbum uit de vroege jaren tachtig na zijn militaire training. Toen hij op de ANC-school in Tanzania Wilma leerde kennen. Dit is jullie huwelijksdag. Dit is onze huwelijksdag. Ja, ik had niet veel meer dan die jurk. En uh, Patrick had ook zijn mooiste kleren die hij had aangetrokken. Probeer me voor te stellen hoe dat voor jou was. Uh, een Nederlands meisje, een jonge vrouw, komt daarheen, geeft wiskunde, maar in een niet alledaagse omgeving. Uh, het was heel erg grappig dat uh, de manier waarop we woonden, niemand kreeg zijn eigen huis. Je, je woonde met z'n allen bij elkaar, blank, zwart. Het is bijna een soort regenboog. Ja. Nazi-idee. Nou, het idee was ook dat mensen moeten natuurlijk in de toekomst dat ook samen kunnen leven. Dus door mensen samen in een huis te plaatsen, kon je in ieder geval aan wennen om samen te wonen. We hadden natuurlijk geen tv of radio zelfs of wat dan ook. Dus wij, wij zaten elke avond om acht uur, dan werd het nieuws voorgelezen. En na, daarna had je van allerlei activiteiten. Soms had je culturele activiteiten. Of er was altijd heel veel zingen, weet je, revolutionaire liederen. Dus het was echt heel inspirerend. Uh, er waren ook wel mensen die het land in geweest waren illegaal. Uh, op een missie. En die kwamen dan terug om ons te vertellen wat ze mee hadden gemaakt. En hoe, wie er eventueel niet meer leefde van die missie. You saw that in the 80s, especially in the 80s, the time that we thought we were intensifying the struggle, the number of people that were killed also increased because the ANC had been infiltrated. And uh, at the time, the South African government had announced that for every five people who joined the ANC, two are my agents. In the camp that I once was when I trained, we were about 500 people and one night we were poisoned the food was poisoned and uh, if it were not for cuban doctors who were uh, stationed a few camps away the whole camp could have been wiped out in het dagelijkse omgang kon je ook niet ervan uitgaan dat degene waar je elke dag mee omging dat die goed was het had net zo goed iemand kunnen het kan net zo goed iemand zijn die geïnfiltreerd heeft. En er waren heel veel infiltranten in het, in het kamp. Het probleem was dat als er eenmaal gezegd werd dat iemand verdacht was... dan kon je eigenlijk niks zeggen. Want op het moment dat je er wat van zou gaan zeggen... dan zou je zelf al verdacht worden. En die argwaan die kon ook jou als ANC'er treffen. Ja. Ben jij ooit verdacht door het ANC van verkeerd gedrag of verkeerde gedachten? Yes. I was very irritated by the way camps were managed, the type of things that were happening. I stood up and I raised some of the matters, uh, manner of running the camps. The sort of people behaving like kings. I raised the issues because they concerned me. But what happened was that the people turned against me like I'm here to destroy the ANC. I'm here to destroy the morale. I'm here to make people not to do what they're supposed to do. It was difficult. Een paar jaar later raakt Patrick weer in conflict met de ANC-leiding. Nu raakt ook Wilma betrokken. Toen um, kwam de ANC-leiding naar mij toe. En die zeiden van, uh, nou bedankt voor wat je hebt gedaan tot zover. Maar uh, we vinden dat je nu uh, maar terug naar Nederland moet. Ik was ondertussen trouwens ook in verwachting. En ze dachten dat als ik wegga, dan, dan gaat hij ook weg. 
En mijn bloeddruk werd steeds hoger. En... Uh... En... en uh... Er kwam gewoon een moment waarop, ik, uh, waarop het gewoon te erg was en de dokter zei van uh, dit, kan je niet meer, uh, dit kan je niet meer doen. Het is niet goed voor je kind. Je kunt niet uh, hiermee doorgaan. En toen hebben we met elkaar besloten dat we teruggingen naar Nederland. En zo zijn er heel veel mensen die heel slecht behandeld zijn uh, in het ANC. En die uh, ja, tot de dag van vandaag bijna hun verhaal niet verteld hebben. En heel veel mensen die op een verschrikkelijke manier geleden hebben. Ja. De tijd is rijp voor verhalen als die van Patrick en Wilma. Het ANC heeft zijn glans verloren. De bevrijdingsbeweging van wel eer na de apartheid aan de macht gekomen is in opspraak. Berichten over corruptie en vriendjespolitiek vullen dagelijks het nieuws. En voor de nieuwe generatie is de maat vol. Het land is in de greep van hevige studentenprotesten. Leraar in opleiding Kululeko is op weg van zijn woonplaats Soweto naar Johannesburg. Zijn stage zit erop. Maar door de studentenprotesten is de universiteit gesloten. Zijn docent geschiedenis heeft daarom een excursie georganiseerd. Naar het Apartheid Museum. Ik ben benieuwd om te weten hoe je TE ervaring went. Ik heb een geweldige TE ervaring. Echt? Yeah. Fabulous. Het was mijn very, very eerste keer dat ik een volledige geschiedenis heb genomen. Dus we kijken naar Jan van Riebeck en zijn arrival en alle die dingen. En de kinderen reageerden goed op je? Ze waren heel, 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 heel,
als studenten toen. Op dezelfde universiteit als Nkululeko, met dezelfde vijand. When we were protesting against apartheid on campus, the police were the enemy. There's no question about that. When they came onto campus and tear gassed and rubber bullets, you know, we fled. But we didn't retaliate with, um, with violence. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's idealistic. <laughs> so how far do you take the violence? I mean, I've been really distressed about the violence. In the history of this country, if you can look, generation and generation, they have a mission. And most of their missions, they fulfill them through violence. And that's how it is. You know, that's how but, it is. But in the lake, we're talking about a society that is very different from this one. In the past, this was a society where there was no freedom, to use your name. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, where, you know, you, you were dealing with a government that was completely opposed to the people. Uh -huh. But what I'm trying to say is that the government that is in power now, they know the method that has been used in the country. So people feel as if like those people were the ones that were fighting in the arm struggle and everything. So because they know the arm struggle and they know that violence also helped them, so why don't we also do the same thing? As with apartheid, a lot of people died, but we eventually got to where we are now. There's Mr. Mandela, Mr. Nelson Mandela, a free man taking his first steps. Onvermogen om de onrust in het land te keren, sancties uit het buitenland, steeds minder steun van landen als de Verenigde Staten en Groot-Brittannië. Eind jaren 80 moet het apartheidsregime wel in gesprek met het ANC. In 1990 komt ANC-leider Nelson Mandela vrij en vier jaar later wordt hij de eerste president van een nieuw Zuid-Afrika. Our plan is to create jobs, promote peace and reconciliation, and to guarantee freedom for all South Africans. We will tackle the widespread poverty so pervasive among the majority of our people. They want change, and change is what they will get. Wilma and Patrick besluit terug te keren naar Zuid-Afrika. Patrick gaat aan de slag als jurist bij de Waarheid en Verzoeningscommissie, ingesteld om daders en slachtoffers van de apartheid inderdaad met elkaar te verzoenen. Wie de waarheid spreekt, komt in aanmerking voor amnestie. Het opent een beerput aan verhalen over martel- en moordpartijen. They put a stick behind your knees. And you were hung upside down. Whilst this was happening, you were suffocating. After they put this uh, cords on my private parts, they put this machine on. They put on this machine. I got torn underneath. How do you go about forgiving this person who is a cruel murderer, who killed a defenseless person, who never killed anyone? Als medewerker van de Waarheid en Verzoeningscommissie komt Patrick oog in oog te staan met kolonel Eugène de Kok, bijgenaamd Prime Evil. Commandant van een geheim martel- en moordcommando in Vlakplaas, buiten Pretoria. Het was moeilijk. Ik bedoel, de Kok, in zijn capaciteit als de commander van Vlakplaas, had een aantal mensen gekregen die ik kende. 
Now we went into this room to sit with him. He was sitting across me just like this. I looked at him, and when I looked at him, I just saw the people that I knew had been killed by him walking in front of me, just pictures of those people. And the more they passed, I just had a feeling they are asking me what are we doing with this man. At a certain moment, my whole stomach just moved. I had to run to the toilet. And I, I just vomited like you don't know. I realized I couldn't sit with this man. A lot of people still do not know what happened with their relatives. They still have lots of pain. But I suppose, um, you know, you can't expect, you could not expect too much from such a process. But the whole idea was that in order for us to form, to, to, brave, to build this one nation, we should be able to look at each other in the eyes. Op zoek naar de thuisbasis van Eugène de Kok, het geheime commandocentrum Vlakplaas, blijkt ook onze producer een verhaal te hebben. I also have a, a missing person, family-wise. Uh, and uh, we don't know if whether that person ended up in Vlakplaas and or what happened. So, Flag Plus is a place that I would like not to even feature in my vocab. It does feel like we are very far away. That's probably the kind of place they needed. Yeah, essentially, surrounded by mountains. As a death squad. Yeah. As I understand it, they would uh, lay them on a fire. Can human beings really hate one another so much so that they will have to ban each other? What am I doing in Flag Plus? Entry on the right risk, okay. Would it be possible to just have... So are you serious? This is the headquarters where Eugene Tekok used to... Kill other black people. Yes, yes. My goodness. Uh, uh, uh. But then these guys, they come and sit here the whole day. Hey, but just the thought of you sitting here the whole day and uh, you knowing about uh, black people who've been bent to death because of their political views, because of their, of their will to, to participate in, in, in the bringing about of democracy. I'm sure this place is a, is a haunted place, this one. How do, they, how do they look themselves in the eye the following day? What are you doing in Flag Plus? It seems like a lovely place right now. I, not, it's not even lovely to me, my friend. I can tell you, I am not seeing anything lovely here. All that I am seeing is just memories of smoke in the 80s. Hey, my bro. It doesn't bother you go to Spanai. Go to Spanai? Yeah. What is it? I go to Katane and I am up home. Ook nu nog zijn er tienduizenden Zuid-Afrikanen die worstelen met vragen over het lot van dierbaren die omkwamen tijdens de apartheid. De Waarheid en Verzoeningscommissie zou het begin zijn van een helingsproces, zo hadden bischop Tutu en Nelson Mandela het voorgesteld. Maar nieuwe generaties lijken daar steeds moeilijker in te geloven. 
Meer dan twintig jaar na afschaffing van de apartheid gaapt er nog altijd een kloof. Tussen blank en zwart, tussen arm en rijk. If we are going back, it's over in Toguti, Bazofara extra police and also Bazofara private security. So, meaning good, it's called a sovereign. You see, one lockdown, yes, you got exactly. So, hey, and because the bad level of bucket in a palm food, food one mistake in you, Rabba in the engineering in general. Our generation is called the born free generation because we are born after 1994. We did not have to fight that battle, you know, of apartheid. So this is why we are called the born freeze. And, and what in fact was promised by the new government to the new generation? All the things that the people needed, housing, education, freedom, and everything. For example, when you look at rural areas, most schools are still mud schools. Some of them are still learning under trees, even in Limpopo, where it is textbooks, it's a problem for them to get textbooks. So there are a lot of promises that have not been delivered, you know. Het nieuwe Zuid-Afrika als teleurstelling. Hoe kijken Born Freeze als Nkululeko dan aan tegen Nelson Mandela? From this early age, you know Mandela. Then you get up, Mandela. Then Mandela. And then it's always Mandela. So <laughs> the notion of Mandela has been like, it's been overused right now. For example, if you are protesting or something, they will use that Mandela thing to say that Mandela wants a peace. He's used to silence voices. He's used to silence poverty. He's used to silence but they're forgetting that he was part of a struggle also. And he won his struggle. This generation has its own struggle. We need to win our own struggle too. What is at stake? Fees, you know, because the rich can access education freely, you know. For us, our parents are cleaners, you know, some of them are teachers, and it's hard for them to actually um, uh, pay the fees. They have been promising free education from 1994 when they got in power, but now they're actually failing. I think we should move. <laughs> you have said violence is acceptable in a democratic state? Well, democracy, you know, it's, it's new to, to, to Africans, you know? It's very new to us. Only got it in 1994, and it's only 22 years. So there's this transition. We're still trying to adapt into democracy. But at the same time, it is seen that democracy, most of the time, protects the states more than it protects the people, and it protects the elites more than it protects the poor. So now that notion is actually being fought against. So we want the poor also, you know, to be protected as much as the state and the elite are protected. And this is why this access to education for the poor needs to be free. Nicolo Leco's docent Michelle Friedman begrijpt de frustratie van de studenten maar al te goed. Ook voor haar voelt dit niet als het vrije Zuid-Afrika waarvoor ze als studenten in de jaren 80 de straat op ging. I think that a lot of the anger of students is about white privilege. Um, that they come to university, they see whites driving cars, they see them not having to struggle. I think what they want is for white students to acknowledge that privilege. 
Yeah, and white teachers. And white teachers. And I, I don't think that the white students really do acknowledge it. On top of it all, you may lose your job. <laughs> yes. Why is that? Well, I, I don't know if I'm representing this correctly, but it does seem to me that Witz believes to transform, you simply just replace a white face with a black face. And um, if someone has the same qualifications as me, um, they'll get the job. These kids really appreciate you <laughs> as a teacher. I can see that. Look, I'm devastated in many ways. I've put, I put all my energy into teaching, and um, I'm also old. It's very difficult to find another job. You know, people don't really want to hire me. But I would gracefully step out because I don't deny my white privilege. You know, um, I was brought up under apartheid. I didn't support it, but there's no doubt that I, as a white person, benefited from apartheid. You know, I was able to go to a good school have a good education, and the guilt of that has been enormous. And I find now, in a free South Africa, I still carry that guilt. And uh, it's, it's not my time anymore. And I think that is right in many ways. It's just when it is you <laughs> and it's personal, it's, it's very hard to accept that. But I think it's right. Patrick, good to see you again. Hey. Very different surroundings here. Yes, well, very different from uh, where we were. This street here, Maud Street, is probably the most expensive street of Africa. In wow. terms of land. How and much your land? offices are here in the, in the heart of Africa. Our offices are uh, here in the, in, the, in, the, in the heart of Africa. Uh, so there is a reason for it. When I started at the bar, there were the view of most uh, South Africans, especially white people, was that uh, black people do criminal law because they, are not in, they have no businesses, but they have a lot of criminals, or people who become criminals in, from their societies. So when we wanted to establish a group and deciding where to put the group, we decided because we were dealing with um, perceptions, attitudes, we were going to put our offices here in Santin, in the commercial center of, of, of South Africa, because we can do it. There is nothing that stops us from doing this complex commercial law. The youngest. <laughs> Hi. Nice to meet you. What are the things you must appreciate about black lawyers, specifically black advocates, is because most of us are first generation advocates, we have what is almost a lack of support when you come to the bar. Um, we don't have uncles and grandfathers and fathers at the bar who you can learn from and who can introduce you to their networks. Um, but Patrick has played that role for many of us. We, he has provided that support, that mentoring, and that's what he's done for me for almost two decades. Good morning. It's uh, such a great pleasure for me to join you at uh, assembly this morning. Uh, the last time I was uh, in assembly here was 46 years ago. I was admitted on two conditions by the principal then. The first condition was that my mother had to organize four rand because she said she didn't have money to buy books for me. I had to transcribe all the books. And for six months, I was spending my nights transcribing those books. Now, the idea of this library that we are sponsoring, 
Vilma and myself is to have access to those books, to knowledge, so that you don't have to transcribe books, but also that you can expand your knowledge because in Mount Frey and all these areas here, we don't have gold, we don't have diamonds. Our only diamond, our only way in which we can reach success is by applying ourselves to our studies so that we are able to get better jobs. Thank you. I just, you can see in our people, the amount of pain that we have, what you are carrying, and in a way it makes it difficult to actually go forward. The process of healing this country, these people here, is a process that's going to take years. Speciaal voor iedereen.